Welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm Luke Bedema. I'm one of the reporters here at Tortoise. Um, and listening to the first few sessions of the day um, has really made me feel like this is one of the crucial conversations that we need to have, because the, the mentions of e-government, of the sort of digital inclusion that's taking place in the way that we do politics have been sort of uh, fast and frequent this morning. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, jo uh, Jamie Suskin, who's the author of Digital Republic, um, also an active barrister, but someone who's studied very extensively the relationship between technology and democracy. Um, and also to uh, Georgina Maratheftis, who is um, an associate director for local public services at Tech UK, um, which hopefully you'll be able to explain a bit more about that role, but really entails looking at how we can digitally enable public service, local public service, and I suppose enhance the relationship between people and government through tech. Um, what, what I spend a lot of time doing at Tortoise is looking at the behavior of big tech platforms and thinking about how they affect our society. Um, and the significance of that relationship, it's like, I think it's been really well illustrated actually this morning where it feels like sort of every fifth or sixth shot we've seen in this coverage is a tweet. Um, and th the reason for that really is that that's sort of the, one of the primary domains in which political ideas are communicated and understood today. So we start with this layer of, you know, the first place to hear what politicians have to say is a digital platform and a private company. But, you know, subsequently, that's where those ideas get negotiated and talked about and criticised and promoted. And I think it's really important that we understand more about that process. Um, but I'd also like, I guess, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, to kind of tot up, I suppose, whether we're looking at a future in which digitalization is a force for good in our politics or a force for bad. Um, what role will social media, the, the mobile phones that we all have, the, the bot farms and the chat forums, right? What, what are they doing to shape our democracy? And um, my, my colleague, Matt Dancona, who think, I mean, hopefully he'll be back, but he's, he's left the room briefly. Um, he, he put it very well, I think, in their, the, the recent podcast that Tors have done on the rules of, of British democracy when he asked how far are the, sh the, the supercharged networks of the digital era replacing institutions as vectors of power? Because um, that question, and I'd love to put it to you maybe to start, Jamie, is really to ask, have tech platforms become de facto political institutions? Uh, well, firstly, firstly, is this working? Is this amplifying? Great. Firstly, <laughs> thank you so much for having me here. Um, Obviously, this panel being the maybe the second most important political event of the day, but um, hopefully a close second. Um, listen, my book is all about the fact that the digital is political, right? So I, it's, I don't argue that tech companies are states or that they are replacing them. What I do say is that digital technology has become a legitimate and authentic source of power in society. Of course, there are lots of sources of power in society. There's the invisible hand of the, the market, which moves goods and resources around. There are social norms and social pressures, which make us do things we wouldn't otherwise do. There's the great clunking fist of government. And I think in our time, added to these traditional conceptions of pa sources of power, uh, there is code. Why do I say that digital technology possesses or exerts power, or at least gives it to those who own and control it? It's because when we interact with digital technologies, we have no choice but to follow the rules that are embedded in those technologies. So when you try and send a tweet that is more than 280 characters, the tweet will literally not send. The, the code isn't interested in negotiating with you. It's not interested in your special pleadings or your arguments. You can't get a computer to do something it's not otherwise programmed to do. But if it's right that more and more of our lives our actions, our interactions, our transactions are, are, are almost all mediated through digital technology, then we are subject to the rules that are embedded in the code that surrounds us. And those who write the rules uh, increasingly have a form of power. 
So on social media platforms, for instance, we know this. We know that they decide what may be said and may not be said, what should be seen and what isn't, uh, who may do the saying and what form the saying may be done in. But it's the same across a host of fields, whether it's algorithms distributing things of social importance like jobs or mortgages or credit, uh, or whether it's technology in the world around us, a self-driving car that you get in that won't drive over the speed limit because it's programmed not to, mm. even if you're rushing to the hospital. And, and if we stick with that first point just for now about platforms, Twitter being an example, um, you, you write here that um, software engineers have become social engineers. And I was really struck by that term because I think it gets a long way to describing <laughs> this kind of cohort of professionals who started out thinking they were doing one thing. And this is going back to sort of 2008, where the, the re-proliferation of big uh, technology internet companies started out thinking they were doing one thing and now have found themselves doing something quite different. Are they, you think, starting to admit that that's the fact? And, and how should we feel about it? Well, I do believe that software engineers are, are becoming social in engineers, kind of whether they like it or not, or whether they know mm -hmm. it or not. I think the tech industry has always spoken out of both sides of its mouth. The, the, they did tell us, we're going to change the world. We're going to transform the world. This is going to be revolutionary. Nothing, <laughs> nothing will be the same. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's political speech. That is not saying we're a company that's dedicated to shareholder value and the making of profit. That's saying we actually do stuff that is political and not just commercial. At the same time, people like to claim for technology that it is objective, that it's scientific, that it's neutral, that it's rational. And of course, the last few years have showed us that tech is as saturated with biases and prejudices and politics as much as any other realm of society. Mm. So if a group in society assumes great power, and if that power can only really work to the benefit of one group at the, ex for the extent of another, or it redistributes power in society, or it affects the democratic process, that power is political. Yeah. So I, I should have said at the top, please do just raise your hand and catch my eye. Obviously, <coughs> today at a democracy summit, of all places, we'd love to know what you think. Um, and it's as easy as just raising your hand, and we'll, uh, we'll get you a microphone. And um, particularly because I think, I mean, I, just, just raise your hand now if you've checked uh, your social media for news more than five times since you woke up. Today's maybe an outlier day. Um, but uh, uh, another thing that I was interested in, and maybe this is an avenue into kind of the, the other portion of the conversation, which is about enablement and stuff. Um, how many people used the COVID app? Pretty much everyone. Um, there are other things like the HMRC website and, and, and things, I guess, petitions and filings and things that the kind of surface area of government that we do touch on. But could you, could you raise your hand if you feel like that surface area is big enough that you're able to communicate the things you want to communicate to government through the websites and the apps and things that, that we use? OK, that's something. So. Um, Jamie, I'd love to stick just one more thing with you, Jamie, because the, the idea that um, software engineers have become social engineers and platforms are having a, a big effect on the way that we view our politics and how we feel about it. Um, in, in the book, you do, in the end, very helpfully point to some potential solutions. And I wonder if we could rattle through a few of those. You've mentioned algorithms, but there are also, also a piece on regulation, what do you think we should be doing going forward to, to essentially tackle the problem that, that you've already outlined? Well, first of all, just to explain why I think it's a problem, argument number one, digital technologies have power or they give power to those who own and control them. The second stage of the argument is that when a group in society acquires power, that power should be held accountable in an appropriate way. So. If you look at other groups that have assumed social response, positions of social responsibility, be they lawyers, be they doctors, be they pharmacists, be they pilots, we don't just trust them to do their jobs correctly, though we hope that we will. We impose an appropriate degree of oversight, of regulation, of standards, and we give people rights against them uh, in case they mess up. That is a well-functioning society. Uh, a society in which power isn't just left to grow and grow and grow until it becomes unmanageable. So that's the kind of second stage of the argument. Mm. And so then the, the, the second half of my book is all about, well, if, if the tech industry does have a problem of unaccountable power, what might the solutions be? 
And obviously they're different from sector to sector, but I think there are some structural solutions we can do regulating social media platforms at a systems level. I think that there are things we can do for algorithms to make them more transparent and place more duties on those who generate them to show their compliance with the law. Uh, I think we can impose interesting uh, professional or quasi-professional obligations on people who work in the tech industry in, in positions of social responsibility. Why should you have to be a fit and proper person to have a broadcast license, but not to run an enormous social media platform mm. that affects the health of democracy? So I, I, I go through all kinds of things, um, sometimes with my lawyer hat on, um, a very boring hat, uh, and then sometimes with a more jazzy hat of kind of political philosophy. Um, shouldn't have started with the hat analogy. Uh, the, the book has some analogies in it. Some of them are better than the ones I've just given. Um, but that, I, I know that's not a full answer to your question, mm. but th I think I would be deceiving myself if I said that in the course of an answer like this, I could give you some, you know, a, a definitive overview of how we should regulate digital technology. Yeah. It's too complicated. Yeah. And that's partly the problem, I think, that actually, again, going back to that 2008 period, there was a sort of runaway train of what was called, it was literally being called permissionless innovation, mm. right? The mentality that the people building these platforms took was that they would move extremely fast. And this is something you comment on, a philosophy, you move extremely fast, you break things in the process, but in doing so, you get out ahead of anyone who would be able to compete with you and you end up in these sort of dominant market positions. Um, and it's that complexity that's essentially added protection to these companies. We don't understand their function and therefore it's very, very difficult to hold them to account. But th th there's useful stuff here in thinking, you know, accreditation. I, I wonder if you could just comment very, very briefly before we go back to that, the fact that nobody feels like they can speak to government. Um, the idea of regulation that we have emerging in the UK at the moment and the online safety bill, mm. what's your view on that and its potential sort of effectiveness in tackling some of what, what you've just described? So I think one thing I would say is one of the obstacles to effective tech regulation has been a lack of clarity in the way that we think about it. And in particular, a lack of clarity in what we think the purpose of regulation actually is. And there's no right answer to that. The answers to that will be different depending on your political persuasion. Some people think that the purpose of regulation is to maximize liberty. Some people think to maximize social justice. Some people think to improve the quality of democracy. I offer one answer in the book, um, but what I'm really trying to do is say, actually, before we start thinking about laws like the online safety bill, it's worth asking what is our actual fundamental purpose here? What is a liberal approach to the regulation of social media? What is a Repub small r Republican approach? What is a conservative approach? What is a libertarian approach? Um, to answer your question, uh, this may make me unpopular, I think that the, the, the essence of the online safety bill is right because what it is trying to do is regulate social media platforms at the systems level. What does that mean? It means that instead of having the state or a regulator poking around in individual content moderation decisions, it's requiring platforms to have in place appropriate and reasonable systems for achieving certain goals. Those goals are still in flux, but they might be things like you know, reducing extremist content and stuff like that, and, and those goals should be set by uh, the demos, by the people. The reason that's right is that when you're, reg when you're moderating and governing platforms at, like, at an industrial scale, Facebook has more users than Christianity, there's no point focusing on the many thousands of things it will get wrong every day, because it will, even with the assistance of artificial intelligence. Plus, when you are dealing with something which involves the regulation of free expression, you should never be aiming for perfection, you should only be aiming for the reduction of risk. And so the fact that this, this um, laws tries to govern social media platforms at the system level and aims at risk reduction rather than harm elimination, I think is in principle the right approach. The third thing that I do like about it is that it seeks, not perfectly, but it seeks to categorize platforms according to their level of risk before assigning them a, a, a regulatory burden. And mm -hmm. I think that's right. I think your local chat room should not have the same regulatory burden as Facebook or Twitter. And so in principle, I think that's a sense of approach. The actual law is a 294 section monstrosity. Yeah. 
uh, which has acquired all kinds of meaningless and sometimes contradictory barnacles on its hull <laughs> as it has sailed through Parliament. It's another metaphor. Uh, and uh, the... I mean, I don't know where it will end up. I don't know what the, whether the Joint Committee will be able to scrape off some of those barnacles. But in principle, I think it's, it's actually quite a good idea. Mm. Um, it'd be great if you tell us, tell everyone who you are. And I'm one of the few people who've said anything already. So, and John, I wrote a book called Citizens and uh, about participatory democracy and so forth. The question I wanted to ask, really, and the sort of frame to bring in is maybe like, I was really struck by your frame, like, what's the purpose of regulation? Because there's arguably also a question, like, what's the purpose of the tech in the first place? Like, what, what are we trying to do with technology? And um, I, my argument would be a lot of the time we sort of take for granted that, that the purpose of tech is, is to serve people as consumers. And, and even when you're framing the question, like, what are we doing? Uh, do we have enough way to, ways to interact with government? A lot of the things like the, the services, the, the sort of gov.uk kind of revolution that put us arguably ahead of the wider world on tech was, was all in this frame of government as public service mm. and, and sort of user experience as consumers of public services, as opposed to sort of actually, and it's interesting, like Facebook and so forth, actually use language that is arguably in their mission statements that is about kind of making community and democracy work better. Like, so I, I, it's a slightly ill-framed question, but it's just the sort of thoughts to bring into this. There's a, there's a frame, there's a sort of invisible frame maybe within this that is like, are we regulating about a per mm. accepting a, a, a sort of implicit purpose that tech enables us yeah. to consume services better? Or, do, or is there a sort of space for challenging that purpose? And I think you go there, Jamie, in the book, but I'm kind of keen to bring that in of like, how are we using tech actually to make democracy more viable? Yeah. Uh, well, it would be really interesting to turn um, to Georgina on that, but just briefly, the idea perhaps that, you know, prior to 2016, I think as a society, we were much, much less conscious of the potential misuse of social media platforms. So the kind of early history of social media was much less dogged by essentially crises of um, manipulation, misinformation. And I do, do, you, do you agree with that assessment, Jamie? And so we've had to kind of learn a new way of interpreting the purpose of the technology in the, in the private sector for consumers rather than for citizens and, and in a governance, governance sense. We've had to kind of reinterpret that in hindsight, as we realise that we've, bu we've built this system that is, is uh, problematic. I half agree. Uh, I think it is obviously right that until 2016 or so, I think our governing ideas about the tech industry were heavily shaped by a kind of 1990s Californian utopianism, mm. uh, which had never really been challenged. We've been challenging tech a lot more since 2016. And by the way, in academia, for instance, there has been an absolute explosion of work on this. So when I wrote my first book on this topic in 2018, I was still working mostly with this Californian ideology stuff and thinking, where, where is all the work on this? Now you can barely move for, for academics who are specializing in uh, the harmful effects of technology. 2016 was a bit of a watershed, although I'm not always sure for the right reasons. It became obviously a kind of cause celebre among left liberals after Brexit and Trump when they felt that somehow the rules had been broken and that tech had been sort of weaponized against the right side. Very short memories people have. Obviously, when Obama was using people's data mm. in 2008, it was miraculous. Hillary Clinton used techniques that were extremely similar to that which was lambasted by Cambridge Analytica. So there's a degree of cynicism, I think, I'm afraid, about the politicization of the issue, uh, even though I have some sympathy with it. But it's certainly true that since 2016, we've been thinking differently about it. John, your framing is absolutely right. I mean, what my research shows, and people might disagree with me, is that fundamentally technologies develop today primarily according to the logic of the market economy. So that if they, develop, uh, they are developed for profit with us seen as consumers. And it, we therefore shouldn't be surprised that, for instance, a social media platform that is engineered as a pro-profit uh, entity, engineered to make money and consume attention, does not meet the democratic aims of improving deliberation and spreading the flow of true speech. They're just, they're just different things. Mm. So if you engineer a system to do one thing, you can't expect it to do another thing. And the only thing that can bridge the gap between capitalism and democracy is the law. 
And that is what my book essentially argues, is that when it comes to tech, now that we recognize that so many digital technologies are in fact political in their effect and not just commercial or economic concerns, let's swing the dial a little bit back from capitalism towards democracy in the way that they uh, are engineered. The yeah. only way to do that is to change incentives through the law. Mm. So I, I guess swinging that dial in part might have to do with encouraging a more pro-democratic pro means of engaging with technology, not necessarily the social media platforms that sort of dominated the first part of this conversation, but the other things that we can do with technology to promote democracy. And that's really where your sort of interest and, and prof yeah, your professional expertise lies. Um, could you run us through perhaps, you know, what do you see as the big kind of zones in that surface area that, that people as citizens have to interact with government digitally? Like, what are, what are the things on the list? Yeah, thanks, Luke. And I think both um, Jamie and John make some really interesting points. Um, John, absolutely right. We have to start with the citizen. So even though I work for an association that has tech in the name for us, it's very much starting with, you know, what is the problem that, so in my case, local authorities are trying to solve. What are the biggest problems citizens um, you know, are affecting them, what are their biggest priorities, and then bringing in the technology. And also, as both of you were talking, it made me think, actually, pre-pandemic, I think this would have been quite a different discussion, mm. especially for local authorities. Um, there's over 300 of them. Their digital maturity um, is very much different across the the country, but that but the pandemic was very much that catalyst for digital change. We saw, you know, nearly every local authority had to use, you know, video conferencing tools to have those internal meetings. It enabled them to work across boundaries, so they weren't just talking between different teams internally, but you know, connecting with social care with community groups, faith groups, to enable that quick and agile response to, you know, setting up a community volunteer hubs. So I think that was some great examples, but the pandemic very much was that driver for that. So it does make me think, yeah, if, if we had this discussion pre-pandemic, um, mm. how much emphasis we would have had on um, digital democracy. And, and do you think if I'd asked that same question of the room, uh, on the subject of whether they feel like they have enough ways to engage with government digitally um, pre-pandemic, even fewer than no hands would have gone up. <laughs> I know, I was really surprised <laughs> by that. So I think, yeah, there probably would have been even fewer. As John's um, touched on, we had that gov.uk um, revolution, and that was, you know, the whole point of that was you're acting with one interface. You don't have to think about, am I interacting with DWP or HMRC? So that's really interesting um yeah I, i'm not really sure what to take from that but i guess we have to do uh better and i guess when we engage with government and local government departments for them it's all about you know the user experience does it meet a need and that's where they are starting from and we have seen this you know surge of service designers within government but i guess yeah. it's now them having that parity with policy and digital makers and not acting within those silos. So it looks like there's still much more um, yeah, to be done yeah. there, I guess. So that, um, that idea of the rising number of service designers and user experience is obviously like a, it's a tech development term that refers to the way that you know, the software and whatever we use helps us to achieve our aim. That's something that it appears to me now, you know, the government in this country are competing with private companies to hire the individuals capable of doing that well. And I don't know, do you know anything about whether, you know, are they able to compete at all? Yeah, absolutely. That is one of the biggest challenge of governments. I was on a panel last week, um, you know, broader topic on digital transformation yeah. and across local health and central government, they said the, you know, skill and, you know, talent sh shortage is their biggest yeah. um, challenge there. We have seen examples of where they've partnered with industry. And I think the tech industry have a role to play in this. And I guess it comes with social value. So when they do work or, you know, contracted to work um, with a public sector 
body, you know, how can they make sure that they are upskilling the the teams there? Yeah. They're not, you know, just going in, putting their technology uh, and leaving. And we're seeing some great examples um, of that at Greater Manchester Combined Authority level. I know they're working really closely. They've got a really good partnership with um, Virgin Media O2, where it's an actual kind of genuine partnership. They've not only kind of rolled out um, fiber there, they're saying actually how can they invest in the community? Mm. How can they upskill teams and you know upgrade connectivity there? So it goes beyond. So I think the role of industry of is changing from that sales partner to that value added partner. Mm. So we are also seeing a change there and as well. Can, can we trust that those partnerships are going to yield good outcomes? for people or merely make these companies look better? <laughs> um, interesting question. Um, I can't talk on behalf of the, the companies, but um, I'd hope the optimist in me yeah. is kind of, you know, the, the former and it, you know, for us to meet our leveling up our ambition and, you know, create a thriving digital economy. Ultimately, you know, we want the best for, for citizens and we need those skills and places um, to be able to, attract and be a good place for, for both, you know, digital companies and the citizens. Yeah. So um, I think hopefully that they'll do it with, yeah, yeah, in light of doing good for the for the place and community. Interesting. So I'd, lo I'd love to circle back to some of this subject matter in the book, Jamie. But um, there was a phrase that Gina Miller used in one of the uh, earlier sessions today. Um, and she said, we've got to go to e-government. And we didn't get like a laundry list of things that that actually entailed, but it would be interesting now in this session to, you know, try and do that. Um, I would, I'd love to know sort of what is the view in the room, and it was in the slides also, that Estonia became one of the first countries to have a properly ratified election conducted online. The UK, I'm correct in saying Georgina has never done that. Is that right? Yeah, so even even at the sort of local public sector, right. So, I mean, is that something that people in this room are interested in or even in favor of digital elections? Do, do you want to explain, can we, is there another microphone you could get to? Thank you. What, what's interesting to, to you about digital election? Um, mainly accessibility. I think it make I think it would make everyone. You don't have to go out to the polls. You don't have to queue. You don't have to miss work. Even general elections, or you know, or even your local elections, whatever it is. I mean, maybe it's harder for transparency. There's no paper trail. But then again, if you do something like blockchain, like it depends which program you're using to show the trail of the votes or whatever. If that information's accessible, and it's meant to be, I suppose the logistics of trying to make it like anonymous might be harder. But definitely, just mainly accessibility. Yeah, interesting. Do, so, do, do you think the divide over that subject? Um, it feels to me like a generational one, really, which is that I, I think if you polled younger people, they'd be much more in favor of digital elections. Um, do, do, do you get that sense or? Yeah, um, I think at the heart of it, there has to be the, the choice. We're not saying, you know, everything has to be fully digital. It's where there is the need for it, but creating that accessibility so those that can um, and want to, and I think that was the same with the, you know, the remote meetings that we saw um, during the pandemic. Obviously, it was a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, the emergency legislation wasn't extended, but a, a survey from I think both Zoom and the local government association um, thinks, or at least over 80% of elected official councillors saying they do want to continue in a hybrid way, and it's made them engage more with their local groups and, you know, not again, sorry to generalize, but, you know, elected officials there, you know, we wouldn't say they're all of a, a younger demographic. So I think there is that potential um, there, but just as we want, you know, a hybrid way to work, there has to be that choice and balance to make yeah. sure that those within, you know, communities that want to um, vote digitally can, and those that want to exercise their right democratically yeah. to go line up can do as well. Yeah, because so Robert Campbell in uh, the chat is on the subject of digital voting is saying privileged digital exclusion, presumably meaning that actually a move to digital voting would would flip this, the subject of exclusion to mean 
you know, people who don't have access to computers or the digital literacy would find themselves on the outside looking in. Um, yeah, I, is I, that I think um, Burry's, uh, it's very obvious that the discussion um, within the room there is um, white privileged um, Southern um, access to technology, access to Twitter and everything else is uh, hugely skewed to those sorts of people, well educated and everything else. I live in the Northeast and whilst I've been um, heavily engaged in politics uh, through Twitter, as well as through um, writing in paper, the vast majority of people in this city don't have access to that kind of technology exclusively. Even the pandemic and the educational changes that were made by doing things remotely um, was heavily skewed to, again, um, the rich um, or better off white middle class people. Those um, who are sharing a tablet with three children don't get anywhere near that kind of service and, from them. And, and, and Robert, access to any of the technology like that um, is hugely skewed. And we, we don't address that in the first place um, through education, through access to technology, be it in a library or at home, um, we're never going to get a representative um, participation. And Robert, could you find yourself maybe supporting a, a, the hi a hybrid system like the one Georgina has just described, where the old means of voting are still valid, or the traditional means of voting are still valid, but there's a new method that's opened up that's primarily digital? Um, I, I'd worry significantly about that. Um, I'm continuously worried about the involvement of digital technology in even counting paper-based votes. Um, the, um, I'm trying to remember the people who are basically handling the vote counting, because a lot of our, what people don't realize is that a lot of the paper-based vote counting is done electronically. Mm. Um, and and we your, worry what's about- your fear? What's your fear hmm? with that? What is your fear with that? Uh, the people who are owning that, the, again, it's the technical, technology companies being owned by powerful people. And we keep coming back to that. How do we trust that pieces of technology, whether that's um, IDOCs who are, I remember the name now, whether it's IDOCs who has been owned um, substantially by uh, a couple of right-wing politicians, or whether postal votes are being counted through that mechanism, or access to the technology and the manipulation of data and information through things like Facebook and Twitter. Right. Um, it, it, we don't have the rule set and we don't have a mechanism around to even question some of that stuff. Um, yeah. And I think that only excludes more people. And if you look at the one thing I keep coming back to in terms of, for example, the Brexit vote was the number of people who participated in that process was um, very, very small. We've still got this huge number of people who never participated in that vote at all. And they're only, I think, a large proportion of those are the people who feel excluded. And one of the major reasons is they don't get access to any kind of discussion. They Thank don't get Robert. access to any, any services and so on. I, I wonder, Joan, what do you make of that perspective? I guess take, taking the piece in turn, because it's, it's actually a helpful prompt to say the same concerns about how do we trust and have confidence in digital tools made by the private sector, really, they do also apply to public sector digital. And, and just broadly speaking, what, what do you make of, uh, of Robert's perspective? Uh, it's a perspective I, I respect, but don't entirely agree with. Um, I think that with every wave of technology, there is always an initial level of concern that it won't be secure, it won't be appropriate. You know, the idea in the 1990s that lawyers in my profession would be using electronic mail to communicate with their clients was regarded as heretical. It was regarded as ridiculous. Lawyers were said, told that they didn't understand confidentiality. Um, I struggle to see as a matter of logic why if you have a, a, a local election where you can vote in your local station, but if you can't do that because, for instance, you might be a busy working parent uh, and you just don't have time at the beginning or the end of the day, uh, you couldn't do it on your on your phone as well. I don't see how that would reduce involvement. It seems to me that if you if you are adding another way to vote onto a system that already enables you to vote in person, that is only likely to increase your levels of involvement. And by the way, you know what are our turnout levels in local government elections? They're extremely low. So it's not exactly like we're nailing it just now. Mm. Um, I want to just be a little bit provocative as well, though, if I may. Um, 
There's a story that's attributed to Henry Ford, who brought the car to the mass market, that he used to say that if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have told him that they wanted faster horses. And a lot of the way that we think and speak about the future of politics, the future of voting, et cetera, uh, is faster horses thinking. We say, we ask ourselves, how can we do what we already do a bit better or a bit faster? I think it's possible that in the next century, you know, our children and grandchildren, the world will be as different from the current world as the car was from the horse. Just to give a couple of really, what might sound, sound like wild examples, um, you could have an automated system voting on your behalf a thousand times a day, uh, not just every five years for an election or every four years. You could have a system that gathered data about your life and combined it with inputs from you about what your priorities and your principles were about your local area or about the country and voted on your behalf a thousand times a day. And those votes need not be binary, yes or no. It could be Jamie is 60% in favor of this, Jamie's 10%. Jamie's lukewarm about that. And those perspectives could be weighed up in some kind uh, of democratic analysis. And would those analysis. be inferences made by like a, a, a model? Yeah, exactly. So you could have a model, you could fill out a questionnaire with 200 questions about what you think about the world and then it could use all your data and it could, it could help you to participate or actually have you reflect your life experience actually reflected in the political process. As it happens, I think it's a disastrous yeah, idea. Yeah, I was gonna say, who likes yeah. this idea? No, a terrible idea. But um, what you have to, I think it is really naive, really naive for us sitting here to think that the, on, a, on today of all days, to think that the system of democracy that we currently have is the final and best form of human self-government. I think that is really unlikely. So just always remember to think, I think, outside the faster horses paradigm, there probably are ways of self-governing that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, is the microphone still floating around? So we've got to finish in just a few moments. Is that right, Mark? Uh, you can go five Great, five thank you. I'm, I'm wary of taking up too much oxygen, but I just like there are really positive frames to put into this conversation as well, right? I, I mean, I know you wrote about polis and, and Taiwan and like open policy making processes that actually use some of the tools that are emerging often through open source open source software principles to to actually kind of enable a much more constructive and dynamic participatory democracy rather than an, a sort of AI ruling us all kind of scenario. So I, I just sort of want to put into the space that there is actually some really positive kind of dreaming to be done in this space as well, not just the sort of problem solution analysis. Well, you probably should have led with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, the, the, oh yes, please, please, can we hand that? Thank you. Um, I run a non-profit which uh, is based on increasing AI literacy um, and part of the reason for that is that so that people can have more of a say uh, exactly on what kind of policy regulation etc that they want and the problem is now is that um, you know the faster horses analogy is that if people don't understand and that includes quite often policy makers it includes people in government so when we say the public you know public understanding of AI that includes people working in technology companies and I just wanted to pick up on um, this kind of idea of AI ruling us all, because it will never be AI ruling us all, it will always be the people who are making decisions behind that, and it's very, very easy for us to kind of think that, that the, you know, the algorithms are going to be, yeah. um, you know, are taking over, and it is, it is, there is so much that is hidden and cloaked decision making behind um, behind that, yeah. and I, I feel that even the, the kind of terms that we're using, and I agreed to some extent with the, 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 the person on the screen earlier um, about this this kind of the exclusionary um, the, the kind of digital divide and digital poverty which is a real thing and with the impact of you know technology that is far outpacing people's ability to comprehend it that is only going to get bigger so we do need to completely agree with hybrid systems but think about those people that are being left behind or don't understand and find ways to enable the public to be saying to tech companies yeah. not just we're not just asking them you know oh well user needs let's kind of work out a good user interface or what yeah. your user needs are if they don't understand what the possibilities and potential and how, how would you start to do that do you think 
Uh, well, I mean, AI literacy was, was kind of left out of the national AI strategy. There's a big focus on skills at the moment, so mm -hmm. on AI skills, um, and there's a lot of you know, great money that's gone into um, increasing that and increasing the diversity of people involved in AI, because obviously one of the big problems is that you know, it's, it's designed for a small mm. group of select people for people like them, so, so there are those things, but we need to get further down the pipeline. So you know, thinking about how we, we, we think about technology and AI within you know, school curriculums, it impacts every single subject in the curriculum it shouldn't just be computer science yeah. which is taken by particular types of people and Georgina mentioned partnership with industry partnership between government institutions and presumably also potentially educational institutions oh. and industry is that something you put a lot of faith in as a way to sort of build up our overall literacy uh, absolutely. competence. Absolutely, and I think partnerships, so, so, so I said when we talk about the public, that includes people in tech companies. So there are people in tech companies using technology and in charge of it that they have no idea themselves, you know, mm. kind of really what the implications are, the best way to use it. Um, but they're incredibly powerful. Um, and and uh, I think you said earlier, at the end of the day in a market, um, you know, a market economy, we can't just wag our fingers at big tech companies and say, you must do better. It's not, it's not their job to do better. It's our job to make it you know, shareholder value yeah. for them to do their job better. And a lot of people in tech companies who get maligned as being, you know, kind of, uh, you know, evil sociopaths, and, you know, there are a few of them, but generally they're people with hopes and fears and families and want democracy and, and, and the rest of it as much as anyone else. So we have to work. We have to work with tech companies because it's it's a, it's a question of you know creating new models and, and I think democracy is um, or a better democratic process is at the part of that, that this and, and, and AI um, technologies you know data driven technologies um, are you know are going to change that yeah. you know e even more and 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 again the previous um, kind of caller was 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 questioning digital vote counting. Well, tech solutionism has, you know, is an issue. Mm. Um, and that's why we need the public. And, and I, I haven't read your book, so I, I, I should be careful about what I say about the word citizen, but we've all been banding around the word citizen. It's a very exclusionary word for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, especially these days with the immigration, you know, mm. issues. And, and I think that, that even for me, the word, you know, kind of let's ask the citizens what they think. We need to even rethink that because that's a very loaded um, term. Um, and, um, yeah, it's not one, you know, we'd kind of, you struggle. It's like public people, demos, you know. Yeah. But, but, but I think citizen is, is a very loaded exclusionary term so to be using. Thank yeah. you very much. Really, really thoughtful. Um, before we wrap up, I'd love to, to give um, Jamie, Georgina, a chance to comment on some of what's been said. I don't know, do you, Jamie, do you have any reflections on that idea? Because obviously one of the things you talk about quite extensively is, you know, we, we have to wake up to the reality that's around us, something we've essentially been blind to for a long time, which is the gulf that exists between technological capability and our understanding of it. What do you make of that idea? I agree with almost everything you said. I, I think that we are increasingly surrounded by digital technologies, which many of us don't understand, still less control. And those technologies are becoming more capable. They're becoming more capable at, a, at an increasing rate. And they're becoming more ubiquitous. It's a major, major change in human civilization calling it the fourth industrial revolution, as some people do, is, is, a, is a, 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 an absolutely classically Davos way of putting what is actually a political change. It's not, this isn't just about industry. This isn't just about money and commerce and economy. The way, when, a, when a society changes the way that it stores, produces, and communicates information, so moving from an oral society to a written society, a written society to a print society, a print society to a digital society, political, and civilizational change always follows, mm -hmm. always. And we are the first generation that we have the chance to kind of um, shape the path. Are we, going to, are we going to harness the power of digital te technology to make ourselves more free, to make our democracy more rich, to make our systems of uh, economics more socially just? Or are we just going to sit back slumped in our historical chair and let these things be done to mm -hmm. us? and then be surprised when a system that is developed in the market economy doesn't make the world more democratic, doesn't make the world more free, doesn't make the world more just. I know which one I prefer. Yeah. Very, very briefly, Georgina, how do we make more hands go up next time we ask that question? One thing. <laughs> I always say this, but I think it comes back to 
collaboration. Um, I think tech is the easy bit. And apologies, I didn't catch your name, and I'll take away that that whole citizen piece really got me thinking. And also, just want to say that Rob was absolutely right to mention a digital excluded. We can't forget that no one benefits to everyone benefits, and it goes beyond just providing a, a device. The tech is the easy bit. We can procure that, but how do we show what the art of the possible is? How do we bring others? on the journey to make sure they, they actually use it, because there's no point just plonking some tech there if, you know, frontline workers or social care workers don't feel equipped or empowered to use it. So that's why I think, you know, collaboration, as I say, across the place is important, and maybe digital can enable that collaboration for some, but yeah. that's what, it, yeah, I think it comes back to. Brilliant. Well, I can't thank you both enough. Uh, we've got to wrap it up. Uh, please do stick around for the rest of the day. Um, and thanks to everyone who's weighed in. Thank you. Thank you.